we get into this video, I want to start by making a couple general points. I know the title of this video series is about finding the best character, and that's probably impossible. I think the main reason I really wanted to do this video series is not just because I'm interested in finding the best, but also I want to look at great detail at our favorite characters. I think this really scratches a special itch for me. Think about your favorite show. How many times have you seen it? Your comfort show. Mine is Scrubs. I've seen every episode of every season probably 10 times. I can quote every janitor line. I remember every Turk moment. This is why I really wanted to talk about House. House is so many people's comfort show. I personally have seen it twice and I love it, but I haven't seen it as much as others. And beyond House just being a comfort show, I was really intrigued by not only the way that Laurie portrays the character, but how they wrote him. How he interacts with his patients, how they make him think. All his little character nuances. And that's when I got to thinking. He's gotta be up there as one of the best. House does this a lot on the show. He conflicts with his own team members, bosses, coworkers, friends, everyone. I'll bucket the three most frequent types of chaos into three different areas. House versus authority, house versus his team, and house versus house. Oh my God. House acts kind of like a lone ranger without remorse. He's definitely the, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than wait for permission type of guy. Minus the forgiveness part. Oh my God. Authority figures, red tape, and hospital bureaucracy are all a massive waste of his time. In season one, a rich investor named Edward Vogler takes over the board of directors after he donates $100 million. What are your superpowers again? I'm rich. The type of structure that Vogler thrives on, lab coats, respect, order, House dismisses as completely irrelevant. Vogler's main goal is to run clinical trials and make the hospital a lot of money. Clinical trials save thousands of lives. He's using patients as guinea pigs. Pharmaceutical companies do that every day. Are we a pharmaceutical company? We're gonna wind up pressuring desperate patients into choices that are bad for them, good for us. We're gonna compromise patient care. When Vogler demands House gives a speech at a conference and House chooses to go out in a blaze of glory, his team member Cameron quits before House has to fire someone. You're abrasive and rude, but I figured everything you do, you do it to help people. But I was wrong. You do it because it's right. This is something they really leaned into at first with House. He's not afraid to speak up and do what's right, even if it's unconventional or wrong. Stop hiding. I'm asking you if you want to live or die. You can't even say that. What do you want me to do? Cry? Yes! I want you to tell me that your life is important to you, because I don't know. Because that's what's on the table right now. Your life. Eventually, Vogler leaves the hospital, saying either he goes or I go. Bye, have a great time. In season three, House meets a clinic patient named Michael Tritter, who comes in thinking he has an STD. When this disgruntled patient doesn't like House's demeanor and notices his Vicodin addiction, he calls House out, even tripping him as he leaves the room. Instead of easing up or apologizing, House does this. Bend over. You could have an infection, you'd have a fever. But you're chewing nicotine gum, which messes with the weather in your mouth, so I need to vacation elsewhere. Oh. Did you ever get that thing where you're sure you forgot something, but you can't figure out what? Guess it can't be that important. Unfortunately, this little stint catches up with House. Tritter, who happens to be a detective, arrests House confiscates all his Vicodin and attempts to get House's co-workers to testify against him. When House finally apologizes, it isn't enough. You son of a bitch. Take it easy, champ. 
I'm going to talk a little more in depth later about the beginning of season six, where House gets admitted to Mayfield Psychiatric Hospital. But for now, I'm going to frame this as the conflict exclusively between House and Mayfield's most senior psychiatrist, Daryl Nolan. Nolan is portrayed by the phenomenal and hilarious actor Andre Brower. PhD is a doctorate. It's literally describing a doctor. Maybe let's refocus. No, the problem here is that medical practitioners have co-opted the word doctor. Okay, Captain. Now, I know we live in a world where anything can mean anything, and nobody even cares about etymology. <sighs> Apparently that's a trigger for me. Yeah. Towards the end of season five, House has a huge mental break, mostly starting because of Kuttner's suicide, experimenting with methadone, and hallucinating, seeing the ghosts of two dead co-workers. When House detoxes from drugs and tries to leave this hospital, Nolan informs him he can go, but if he ever wants to practice medicine again, he has to undergo treatment. Well, legally, you're free to go whenever you want, but I suggest you stay. You can't go back to practicing medicine. I don't want to practice medicine. I've decided I want to be an astronaut. Well, if you want your state astronaut's license, you're going to need my recommendation. House defies conventional treatment any way he can. He cheeks pills, antagonizes other patients, even attempts to blackmail Nolan. But Nolan doesn't get pulled into House's weird vortex of misery and deceit. He attempts to learn about him, challenge him, and get him the help he needs. I really like the relationship between House and Nolan, especially after House is discharged and season six continues. Wait, back up. Is that Lynn manuel Miranda? Jesus, oh, his breath smells like salmon. House initially really pushes back against Nolan's therapy, but when House actually begins to trust Nolan, he sees positive results. I think the difference between Nolan and the other two men I mentioned is that Nolan actually did have House's best interests at heart. He wasn't created to be an impediment for House, but to help him grow. The authority figure that House has to deal with most frequently is Lisa Cuddy. The reason Cuddy is last on this list of authority figures is because she's the ultimate roadblock to anything he wants to do. She's the straight arrowed person in charge that always pushes back on House's crazy decisions, especially when they're out of nowhere. You're the first boss he's ever had who could handle him. Before you, he was either fired or buried under a mountain of malpractice suits. He needs someone to say no. He needs someone he'll listen to. As I mentioned in the first video, House was blacklisted after he was caught cheating in med school. Cuddy gave him a second chance by hiring him, but now she feels bound to him and allows him to walk all over her. She trusts him, which is a big plus that allows him to get away with doing pretty much whatever he wants. That, and he's almost always right. For so many seasons, we see that will they won't they chemistry between the two. Stop! Don't move. The way the soft evening light catches your eyes, the gentle caress of dusk on your hair as you turn around and leave my office without giving me that file. <laughs> Wait, what? Their bantering and tension really made the show work for quite a while. They do have great chemistry, at least in my opinion. In your opinion. In, in your opinion. Until, of course, they actually get together. But I'll get more into that later. And yes, I'll bring proof. Where are you going? To the proof store. Another common area of conflict with House is with the team members that work for him. House usually has a team of three or four employees. They're his lackeys. They run his tests, talk to his patients. <laughs> they even wash his car. But most of all, they worship him and know that a position working for him is something anyone else would kill for. I would kill for a chance to work with him. Like literally skin you and wear you as a disguise. Oh. House loves to test his team members constantly, bounce ideas off them, and even commends them for standing up. Sometimes. <laughs> Another main reason that House is always feuding with his team members is because he's always getting involved in their personal lives. He tries to learn facts about their pasts, or even figure out why they came to work two minutes late. He enjoys dredging up dirt and outing people's secrets in front of the other team members. And this doesn't just happen occasionally. It's every single episode. House uses his brilliant analytical skills 
to deduce something about someone he works with and cannot stop focusing on it until he gets an answer. He thrives on conflict and is looking for someone to torment. Don't let it be us. I believe House does this for three reasons. First, it's because he's obsessed with finding answers and learning everything he can about everyone. Secondly, because he likes to sow the seeds of chaos and let others know that he can always win and come out on top. And third, well, he just does it for the hell of it. I personally believe it's a blend of all three. However, there might be something to the tough love approach. House doesn't like weakness and maybe, just maybe, he makes them better doctors because of it. You relentlessly mock, but it's not for self-aggrandizement. It's because ideas are bigger than feelings. I also thought you had the side effect of desensitizing me. House never gives compliments and never validates his team members. He's always making them work long hours, stay late, and even second guessing themselves. But maybe he does this because it makes them better. This brings us to our final of the three areas of conflict. And this, to me, is what the show's really about. First and foremost, House is an addict. You learn anything? Yeah. I'm an addict. Alrighty then. We see he abuses his prescriptions and numbs all his pain any chance he gets. And when he attempts to stop, he suffers terrible withdrawals. His addiction, and the trouble it gets him into, drives more storylines than I can count. I love this quote by Hugh Laurie, who actually tried Vicodin to see how it made him feel. But let's be reasonable. House has an agonizing disability. And of course those pills are to numb his leg pain. They couldn't be used for any other reason, right? How many of those pills are you taking? I'm in pain. Yeah. Aren't we all? In one episode, House fakes cancer to get into a clinical trial that will allow for an implant to be put into his brain that gives him constant narcotic relief. When his coworkers think that he's got cancer, he doesn't even seem to care that they're upset. He just focuses on getting in the trial. The most peculiar thing is that this pain seems to be extremely psychosomatic at times and often worsens when House experiences mental or emotional loss. We see throughout the series, instead of grieving, crying, or dealing with his emotional pain in a normal way, he instead takes pills because of course his leg is worse now. In season seven, Cuddy goes through a huge cancer scare and how does House deal with this? He gets high. When you came to my hospital room that night, you were stoned. You don't take Vicodin because you're scared. You take it so you won't feel pain. Everything you've ever done is to avoid pain. Drugs, sarcasm, keeping everybody at arm's length so no one can hurt you. Pain happens when you care. In episode 13 of season two, titled Skin Deep, House is in so much pain from his leg that he gets Cuddy to give him a direct shot of morphine. After he solves his case due to his pain being managed, he goes back for another shot. It wasn't morphine. What did you give me? I told you I wanted- It was saline. I gave you a placebo. As funny as this sounds, this pain helps House be miserable and it's almost like he needs this to be happy. In the first episode of season three, titled Meaning, we come to learn that House has been off painkillers for three months after falling into a brief coma after he was shot. He asked to be given ketamine and miraculously, he woke up without any more chronic pain. Not only do we see House not limping for the first time and running, but we see him taking two cases at once, all firsts for the show. The most ironic part about all of this though, he seems to be miserable. He isn't joking, he's more withdrawn, and he seems lifeless. Being miserable doesn't make you better than anybody else, House. It just makes you miserable. We see this again in season five, when House starts to take methadone. 
a drug that completely removes his pain. He clearly doesn't act like himself. He doesn't joke, mock, and he even indulges a patient's family member's request, something he would never do under normal circumstances. He even shaves and begins interviewing for another job. His coworkers are actually concerned because he's acting normal, and this is so unlike him. Who are you? We're obviously talking about addiction here, but there's something else I really wanted to talk about, and that's self-sabotage. House has an obsessive need to subconsciously sabotage pretty much everything in his life. We see this through the entire series. On a healthy leg. Oh, here we go. If you've got a good life, if you're healthy, you've got no reason to bitch, no reason to hate life. Well, here's the flaw in your argument. If I enjoy hating life, I don't hate life, I enjoy it. I didn't say it was rational. In season two, House spends weeks gathering dirt on his ex Stacy's new husband to sabotage their relationship because House still loves her. House's ploy works, and after Stacy admits she still loves him, he almost immediately reneges, telling her they won't work together. It's been all these months chasing me. Now I'm here and you start running? What the hell changed? Nothing. Nothing changes. I'm not gonna change. Who asked you to? Mark is willing to do whatever it takes. I'm not. There are so many examples of this type of self-sabotage as well. As I said before, when House bombs a pharmaceutical speech, or when he messes with Tritter, what about when he drunkenly jumps from a hotel balcony into a pool? Or when he tries to get Lisa Cuddy to admit that she likes him by announcing to the entire hospital he slept with her. I think the funniest part is after she comes to confront him after this, House does this. I was wondering if we should move in together. What? What about when House obliterates his relationship with Cuddy by ramming her house with his car to return a comb, <laughs> causing his parole to be revoked? The list of self-sabotage is practically endless. But why does House insist on doing this? Is it because he wants to feel alive and all the numbing from the Vicodin makes it harder for him to feel emotions? Or is it because he's really suicidal and he doesn't care whether he lives or dies and reaps the rewards of being reckless? Is it because he's a masochist and he doesn't know how to be happy? Does being happy go against his belief that everyone should be miserable? Or is it because House is so much smarter than everyone around him, he knows that he'll never be happy? I think House sabotages his life for a blend of the above reasons, but I think most of all, it's where he's most at home, being miserable. He numbs all pain with Vicodin. And most of the time, he inflicts that pain on himself. And at the end of the show, House destroys his own life to an irreparable degree. But for the first time, it's for someone else's benefit. More on that later. He's done. Yes, I slept with her. Seriously? No. Yes, you did. Yes, I did. Seriously? No. Okay, it was funny the first time, lads. House is like a hormonal teenager when it comes to relationships. He's misogynistic and immature. He doesn't like to get mushy-gushy, and he hates empty gestures. After all, House's personality and abrasive humor don't exactly bring all the girls to the yard. If you're coming back just because you're attracted to the shine of my neediness, I'd be okay with that. But throughout the show, in at least some capacity, there's a love interest in plain sight for him. In season one, one of his team members, Cameron, starts to fall for him, and we get to see House be awkward and not really know how to handle someone being interested in him. Another big love interest early on was his ex-girlfriend, Stacy. Her character is introduced towards the end of season one, and it's clear that House hasn't fully moved on from her. Unfortunately, Stacy's married now, but the chemistry between her and House is still apparent. And I really like her. She's strong, intelligent, and their relationship evolves and grows throughout the entirety of season two. House pulls every sinister trick in the book to try to break them up, and eventually it works. <laughs> Stacy begins to fall back in love with House and tells him she's willing to leave her husband for him. 
in almost the same breath. As I mentioned before, though, how stumps her. What a guy. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! We only really see House fall head over heels in love for someone once. Lydia, during the broken plotline. It's really moving how their love genuinely and quickly evolves. It's short-lived, and pretty crushing when it ends. But it feels like the first time House really connects and falls actually in love. Afterwards, he's such a mess. But a human mess. A manageable mess. He acts how a normal person would after they put themselves out there and get burned. And I really love that we get to see him like this. He shows humanity in what it's like to be really vulnerable. And it's beautiful. I also could talk about Dominica, the woman House marries after him and Cuddy break up. But I feel like it's more of a forced plotline and a revenge ploy than anything else. Plus, to be honest, everything after season 6 kind of feels like a joke. Would you like to get a drink sometime after work? You mean all of us or just us? I was thinking just the two of us. Did Tal put you up to this? No, I, it was just something I've been thinking about and I figured, what the heck, might as well ask. This finally brings us to Cuddy. I do applaud the show for not forcing romance between Huddy too early. Yes, I said Huddy. I like that the show is able to put two opposing leads of the opposite sex together and not force them together too fast. Have you seen my balls? Grab my balls! He had it in his head! I think it's a nice prize, too. It would have been a good ending to the show. Once Cuddy and House get together, I'll be honest, it all goes downhill. I think it's because the writers didn't really know what to do with this. House is not a happy, relationshipy type of guy. Do you want to know how I feel? I feel hurt. Okay, that was actually a pretty good moment, but still, the whole character's interesting because of his aversion to being close to others. Lisa Cuddy is the only person that really pushes back on House can deal with his misogyny, and still trust him enough to do what he thinks is best for his patients. You're the first boss he's ever had who can handle him. Before you, he was either fired or buried under a mountain of malpractices. He needs someone to say no. He needs someone he'll listen to when they say no. If you really care about House, you'll stop feeling sorry for him and get out there and start kicking him where he needs kicking. Whoa. But House, on some level, still respects her, and subconsciously we know he wants to be with her. She's beautiful, in a position of power, and can deal with his bull. You don't need to say much more. We done here. The first time we see House and Cuddy together at the beginning of season 7, they spend the entire episode in his apartment playing video games, doing party tricks, goofing off, and having fun. And part of me is really happy that House gets the woman he probably doesn't deserve. But by the end of the episode, House insists they won't work as a couple. And while Cuddy pushes back, and they stay together for about half the season, they do eventually split. House can't change. He goes back on Vicodin, becomes self-destructive, and messes up his life all over again. I hate this, because we see House go through such a magical transformation in Season 6, and really, the show should have ended there. You might be thinking, I've covered all the important relationships, right? I think we're missing one last important one. Wilson! Wilson. Wilson! Oh Wilson, you baby-faced multi-marriage mess. Listen, I really like Wilson. I like that he's a sympathetic, caring, intelligent guy who occasionally gives House's wit a run for his money. Sometimes. You're an ass. I also appreciate that Wilson brings his own unique levity to the show. This is getting confusing. And Wilson really seems to be House's antithesis as well. He identifies better with his patients. He cares about the people around him and how they feel. He even has a conscience. So it's nice to see that him and House have such a nice friendship together. In reality, 
All we really want to see is a bromance between House and Wilson, where they hang out, drink beers, and walk off into the sunset. But please, whatever you do, don't rule 34 this. Don't. Don't. Let's first start with brief summaries of each season and what House goes through in each. At the beginning of the show, House's polarizing characteristics are made very apparent. I'm sorry, I missed that. Could, could you do that again? He's eccentric, outspoken, and all the things I've said before. And the writers really wanted to show this off. In season one, House connects really well with his patients. Something that doesn't happen as much later in the show. There's going to be an emergency meeting of the transplant committee to discuss where you fall on a list should a new heart become available. Problem is, I am required to tell the committee about your bulimia. It's a major psychiatric condition. So you're here to tell me I have just a few hours to live? Unless I lie to the committee. But if they find out, I lose my medical license. I don't want to die. In the sophomore season, the cases get more zebra-esque, but also more entertaining. And watching House hit home runs every time is just so satisfying. The first half of the season focuses on his ex-girlfriend Stacy. We know that House is still in love with her and we get to see their chemistry in full view. It's really interesting to see him and how he acts when he's in love with someone. And there's some really great episodes in season 2. The episode where Chase makes a fatal mistake after learning his father passes, or the two-parter where Foreman nearly dies. The sophomore year of this show was great. House pushes his team to the limits and scolds his patients to make logical decisions. The season ends with House being shot, and when he realizes that a fight with Wilson and discussions with his team were all hallucinations, House demands they give him a drug that might cure his chronic pain. The season ends on a big cliffhanger. The ketamine treatment House insisted on work, and at the start of season 3, we see House running, something that's new to us. And while him being pain-free doesn't last, it allows us to see House moving around without his signature cane. Season 3 mostly follows the same flow as Season 2, except with the traitor conflict spanning about half the season. House continues to be House, on his never-ending quest to find answers at all costs. He has a conversation with a patient about euthanasia, helps Eve deal with her recent rape, Cuddy finally confronts House about his feelings, and House lies to a suicidal teenager about keeping her secret in order to get her the help she needs. This season ends with House teamless. He fires Chase, and both Foreman and Cameron resign. I think season 4 is really where House shines. The season starts with House opening up his job positions to a room full of prospects angling for the spots. House really embraces the chaos and puts these doctors through insane, ridiculous tests, embracing what it's like to be boss and in control. It's a fresh and fun season, and we get to meet a lot of new characters, like Taub, 13, and Kuttner, that really shake up the formula of the show. And while this season was shorter due to the writer's strike, it contained some of the best episodes of the show, like House's Head and Wilson's Heart. In season 5, Wilson and House's relationship struggles, but starts to slowly heal after Wilson's girlfriend Amber dies. Cuddy and House kiss for the first time, and Wilson tries to get them to admit their feelings to each other. I'm not here to play matchmaker. Oh. House also takes methadone during this season to try to cure his leg pain. And most importantly, we learn House used to be a cheerleader. Got he! House is clearly very affected by Cutner's suicide towards the end of season 5. He begins to hallucinate, struggle to sleep, and even has a complete delusion of an intimate night with Cuddy. House realizes he needs help, and Wilson takes him to Mayfield Hospital. We finally wonder, House will get the help he needs to treat his addiction, and his subconscious desire to destroy everything around him. It's not far-fetched to assume I could spend an entire hour talking about season 6. 
the season opens with the two-parter episode titled Broken, where the typical show formula is tossed out. There's no patience for House to diagnose, no team members to bounce ideas off of, no Cuddy to flirt with, and no Wilson to joke around with. Just House in a brand new environment, learning to grow past his typical scheming and manipulation, learning to put his trust in others, even learning to love and learning to make a new friend. It's an amazing two episodes. And after House leaves Mayfield and the season progresses, he really seems to be rehabilitated. First off, I don't think we see him take a single Vicodin pill the entire season. And House really wants to make amends and commits a myriad of selfless acts. He prevents Wilson from giving a speech that might jeopardize his career. Thank you. You're a good friend. He hires Foreman's brother, which seems like a ploy at first, but it turns out it brings them closer together. He writes a check to a former med student who made him believe that House destroyed his life, even after House learns that this story was a complete farce. House even apologizes to a dying patient whose case he didn't accept based on it being not interesting enough. And at the end of the season, we get what I believe is the most important speech House gives in the entire show. And in the same episode, House gets with Cuddy for real this time. Let's wrap the show up with a bow. All the things I just mentioned about great character growth pretty much get thrown out the window in season seven. There's a real regression for the character as the season plays out. And personally, I really hate this. House, once again, puts his own interests before others. Cuddy and him do last for a while in season seven, sure. But she ends up dumping a Vicodin relapsed house after he's completely disengaged and unsupportive during her cancer scare. House then marries a Ukrainian mail order bride in retaliation. Nice. And when the jealousy of Cuddy's new man gets the best of him, well, you know. What did I say his IQ was again? Season 8 marks the final season for House, and with Cuddy gone, and House fresh out of prison, who knows where the show will go. But things get back to normal pretty quickly. House gets new team members, Foreman takes over for Cuddy, and House tiptoes around the rules of his parole. There's a lot of things we could talk about in the show's final season. House's brief stay in prison, subplots and conclusions of the minor characters, House's immigration wife leaving him. But the main takeaway in the final episode, titled Everybody Dies, juxtaposed to the pilot episode named Everybody Lies, we find House lying unconscious in a burning abandoned building next to a patient who died. A lot happens in this episode. This same patient previously offering to take the fall for House's ticket prank, House almost giving up and succumbing to the fire, and us, the viewers, getting one final look into House's psyche thanks to hallucinations from Kuttner, Amber, Cameron, and even Stacy. We see images of what House's life could have been if he made different choices. And when House finally realizes there's still one thing left to live for, he fakes his death and crashes his own funeral. Wilson and House actually get to ride off into the sunset this time. So House is a character. How do we sum him up? Let's first answer the question. Is House a dynamic or static character? This is something I've struggled with for a while. Being dynamic by definition indicates that you transform throughout a story. And if we were to look at the pilot episode and look at the final episode, House is definitely in a different place, making a hefty sacrifice for someone he loves. But is he truly a different person? Has he gone through a complete transformation as a character? I don't think so. Look at the last line of the show. Cancer is boring. To me, this indicates he's still the same house we've come to know. All in just three words, we can deduce. He's sarcastic, disengaged, using humor as a coping mechanism, and bored by the things that aren't solvable in just three words. 
I think the writers probably spent a long time collaborating over what they thought House's final words should be, and this is what they settled on. It shows that, even though he's not a doctor anymore, he's still the same old guy. And if the show were to end right here, right now, I absolutely think House would be a dynamic character. Season 6 saw him make serious personality changes and lifestyle choices that I think constitute a complete transformation. Because of season 7 and 8, I'm going to call House static. You might disagree. Hell, I think I disagree, but that's where we're at. Another thing I notice about House is that he's a man of action, not a man of words. He usually says one thing, but does another, sometimes the complete opposite. All his sabotaging of his own life and pushing people away are actions he commits because it's what he believes to his core. He doesn't reassure or say nice things. He just does what he thinks is right. You can look at it in two ways. Either he appeases him to make him feel better in the moment, or you force him to fight, giving him more time alive. And if actions speak louder than words, then House giving up being a doctor, hell, giving up his life as a free man, instead of saying I love you, that's huge. So where do we go from here? I want to compare House to another television show character that I really love, Captain Hawkeye Pierce from the show MASH. Hawkeye Pierce is a surgeon that gets drafted during the Korean War in the 50s, operating on baby-faced soldiers at a mobile army surgical hospital three miles from the front lines. Episode in and episode out, we see Hawkeye hitting on nurses, drinking till he passes out, and mocking army protocol, disobeying orders left and right to do the right thing. He quips and he jokes as frequently as you and I fill our lungs with air. He never takes anyone seriously and jokes his way out of almost every situation. Sound familiar? Harsh took, dude. But at the end of the day, Hawkeye absolutely delivers when he needs to. He is the pinnacle of a hero and the most phenomenal surgeon anyone has ever seen. When the situation calls for it and the odds are stacked against him, he puts away his snide quippy remarks, his chicanery, and the sarcastic attitude. It gets really serious. And every time, it's extremely impactful. House is the same way, as he makes a mockery and he jokes, but more often than not, he does what's right. Time Can I get bonus points if I act like I care? I'll be honest, Hawkeye is a much more sympathetic, caring person than House will ever be. But on the flip side, I think House is a bit more human and relatable. He can be a coward, and he can run away from responsibility, just like all of us do. He's not always going to be perfect every time that he needs to be. But when the situation calls for it, I think you'd be surprised how often he makes the honorable choice. And that's why this character is so interesting to me. He's so layered, so complex, and honestly, the choices he makes are relatable. And to represent that obscure, sophisticated character with an actor who absolutely blows their performance out of the water. You can't blame yourself for her death. This wasn't your fault. That's the point! I did everything right, she died anyway. All the while being a typical, but not really typical, formulaic show that stands out among the rest. And stack on top the Sherlock-esque, investigative, medical drama aspects on top of that. It's easy to see why people are drawn to this show. Why people like myself are drawn to this character. We are almost there, guys. We've only got one more part to go. Part 3 will be a little bit different, and as a heads up, it'll be a little bit shorter. It'll consist of the final two things I want to talk about. The grab bag analysis, and why we're all here. The metrics. The first section of part 3 will be a bunch of random thoughts and feelings I've compiled over the last few months that I want to share about House and the show. And of course, the second part, where we grab a handful of different dimensions and attempt to objectively rank how great of a character House is. Thanks guys, I'll see you soon.